Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Graduate and Professional Studies webinar. Um, you're very, very welcome, and um, it's been very informative to have you uh, participate in these sessions and to get your input and ideas at the end. And I look forward to get to hearing that uh, before the end of uh, of today's session at the end of this presentation. Uh, this session is called Organizing and Analyzing Qualitative Data in Your PhD. And in some ways it's it's a, it's a, it's not a rehash, but it's just a it's just adding to or building on the session that we looked at on data management in your PhD and techniques of data management in your PhD, which we did back in uh, which was in July. So today we're going to take that somewhat further and look at organizing and analyzing qualitative data in your PhD. Some of this will be quite um, will be um, quite theoretical, I guess, uh, but for the most part, hopefully what it can provide you with is some insight, some advice, some help and tips uh, along the way when you are organizing and analyzing qualitative data in your PhD. So we're just going to start off with a couple of rudimentary things like asking about what is data, looking then at qualitative data and looking at ways then of organizing and analyzing qualitative data, looking at, at things like uh, research design uh, and uh, research the difference between research design research methods and looking at things like qualitative data analysis uh, so and then we'll just have a couple of exercises and i just have a couple of points here for you to reflect on as we're going through and a couple of um uh, assertions and opinions made about uh, qualitative data and qualitative data analysis that i'd like to get your opinions on um but as i say first of all we'll do a reflective exercise and then we'll have a more of a group discussion at the conclusion of this talk today. OK, so uh, fundamental question is just what is data? So uh, data, a standard definition um, of, of what data entails is obviously, you know, it's a representation, representation of facts, of concepts, or perhaps even instructions in a, in a formal or formalized manner, uh, which should be suitable for interpretation, uh, for reasoning, for discussion, calculation, evaluation and processing um, by humans or by electronic machines. So that's a, you know, that's a, a somewhat convoluted definition. We can also just simplify it and say that data is factual information which has to be identified, recorded, stored, retrieved, analyzed, one could say also interpreted and uh, perhaps uh, reported. OK, so qualitative data and again that that definition of data you can look at later. I'll send you all these slides later and if you do need anything, uh, any more information in relation to this uh, webinar or any of the information here, then please get in touch. But let's look at qualitative data and I guess why I, why I, I made this session into qualitative data today is because my own PhD was in the area of qualitative data, but also because uh, I, I don't have any specialism in quantitative data. I know that um, my colleague Anna Dwyer is organizing quite a number of sessions for you um, with regard to quantitative data. And I think that's been done by Sean Lacey um, of the Cork Institute of Technology. And so I'm just looking at the notion of qualitative data and qualitative data an analysis uh, in, in today's session. So it, it will be very distinct from quantitative data. It doesn't mean that if you're engaged in or using quantitative data for your PhD that this isn't relevant to you, but um, it, it may be the case that it's that those who aren't using quality quantitative data might find this hopefully informative. So just to talk about qualitative data, what qualitative data entails. So it's obviously non-numeric information, uh, which I suppose disting distinguishes it immediately from quantitative data. So it can be things like interviews, observations, um, documents, which can't be, if you like, crunched easily by statistical software. So there's a you know distinction there between the kinds of data that qualitative data will yield as opposed to quantitative data. And in no way, when I say, that my PhD involved qualitative data, it is in no way to denigrate uh, quantitative data um, at all. Quantitative data gives us amazing information. Sometimes just it yields fascinating uh, insights, uh, but that's not what we're looking at uh, today. We're looking at, if you like, a more kind of a more um, in-depth 
way of, of yielding, uh, procuring, uh, evaluating and analysing data. Um, I've, I've a, a description here from um, a great, um, uh, if you like, a doyen, one of the gurus of uh, qualitative um, qualitative data analysis, and he being uh, Norman Denzen, who said that um, uh, he talked about people's lived experience, their events or their situations, and he called this he called this thick, as in as in the, the types of information it would give us would be more would be deeper perhaps than what quantitative data would yield and again it's no way to denigrate what quantitative data yields but just um the, the, what Denzen sought was if you like looking at um i suppose richer and more uh, meaningful uh, context be it social cultural or historical context and the experiences and um, emotions that people uh, underwent uh, throughout their lives. And that, that was going to yield, we, one would hope, perhaps more richer content. I won't say better data, but just more deeper data. Um, but obviously there are, there are drawbacks to that as well, because obviously qualitative data can be, it can be very difficult to yield quantitative, qualitative data from great swathes or great contents of the overall population, whereas quantitative data can give us a summation and a snapshot, uh, a picture in time of, of, a, of a whole society. Um, a whole group of people or indeed, you know, um, a whole country. So qu qualitative data, what Denzen was talking about was having, you know, a more rich, uh, I feel like a more lived or a richer um, insight in, 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 into people's lives. But as I say, obviously there are drawbacks with that in terms of sample size and the extent to which we can ex extrapolate and generalize and make deductions about wider society from a small sample. Okay, I want you just to reflect on the following. And these are various statements which have been made about qualitative data. And I just want you to reflect for just just just, just for a moment or two, um, just for a few seconds on, on each of these, and just, just to get your, um, I won't ask you at the moment for your insight, but at the end of this, uh, perhaps you can um, uh, let me know let us know what you think. Um, this is from Snyder from 2010. What do you think of this statement? Numbers impress, but unfortunately also conceal more than they reveal. So just think about that for a moment. Uh, that's one assertion and just see if you agree with that or if you think it's, this is somewhat, um, I don't know, a, a, a somewhat uh, superficial statement. Uh, that 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 Snyder has made. So numbers impress, but unfortunately also conceal more than they reveal. And not something I necessarily agree with, but just uh, I just want you to reflect on that. Um, this is from Davis from um, 2007, uh, and Davis said that good qualitative research has equaled, if not exceeded, quantitative research in status relevance and methodological rigor. Hmm. Okay, so again, just reflect on that. Just um, um, if you think that um, quantitative research, you know, has been exceeded or su surpassed um, by good qualitative research in terms of its status, relevance and, and methodological rigor. Again, if you remember, I think last week we were reflecting upon one of the myths of research, you know, that that some people feel that, you know, without numbers that 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 uh, your data isn't going to yield uh, very good information. But that, if you like, is is, is uh, something of a of a myth with regard to research. And certainly there are a, a, a lot of people who um, uh, champion qualitative data as yielding richer uh, and and more um, more relevant information. Um, this is uh, Miriam who said that back in 2009, who said there is almost no consistency across writers or across researchers in how the philosophical aspect of qualitative research is discussed. Again, you know, um, looking for consistency with regard to how qualitative research is, uh, is discussed or perhaps even identified and, and defined also. Um, sorry. Yeah, just if you reflect on that for a moment or two. 
And next of all, we'll just look here at Souter uh, from 2012, who said that um, every researcher makes sense of the field in a personal, socially constructed way. And, you know, that is something maybe that you all or that we all apply when we're dealing with qualitative data and when we're uh, dealing with research that you make sense of the field in a personal, socially constructed way. OK, so they're, they're just things I just wanted to put out there and just to get you to reflect upon um, as we go through uh, today's webinar, just to see. And maybe at the end we can discuss uh, some of those particular points. These are also questions that I would ask you to consider. You know, how would you describe your own PhD project? Um, how, you know, how will you or how would you deal with any ethical or intellectual property issues that arise? So maybe just first of all, just for a moment, just reflect upon that, describing your own PhD project. How would you, you know, if you had to describe it in, uh, uh, in, in short form to uh, a complete stranger, how would you describe your own P PhD project? So just for a moment or two, just reflect upon that, just as we go through um, these slides. Okay, uh, next thing I'm going to ask you to consider, again, you know, you can reflect on these a lot more when you have these slides afterwards, but how would you deal with any ethical or intellectual property issues that arise in your research, so how, you know, just reflect on how you would actually cope with them um, if there is an ethical dilemma to be resolved, or if there are issues relating to, for example, to sources uh, and ownership of intellectual property. How would you actually deal with those um, throughout your PhD? Um, just think of how your own data and your own research material. How is it, how how is it going to be documented? And how is it going to be described? And again, some of these we dealt with earlier in the session on um, on data management, data management throughout your PhD. But again, just to reflect on those, um, think about you know is your is your project dealing with a sensitive area of research? Are there vulnerable participants involved, and what are the implications of that? Just uh, for I know for some of you that will be the case. Um, think about also what data or research materials are you going to create and, and collect? So uh, reflect upon that for a moment also um, throughout your PhD. What data do you intend to, to create or indeed uh, to collect and analyze uh, throughout your PhD? Um, and just think about the policies you'll apply in terms of ethics and in terms of data management. Um, what are the actual, um, if you like, what are the standards that the university expects or what are the policies that are there with regard to data management and storage and retrieval um, uh, and if you like, and disposal of, um, of, of data and particularly sensitive data um, at, the, at the end of your project, you know, and for how many years or for how long will you be required to hold on to um, your data at the after your PhD has, has has finished? So think about those also, and um, just think about you know does your does your department or does your school does it require something called a data management plan um, as part of PhD progression? I, I know for some of you that is the case. For some, I, I may just be for a small number of you, but I know it certainly applies to 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 some people. So that's just a question maybe for you to consider. Do you need a data management plan for your PhD? So we're just talking about, you know, organizing and analyzing qualitative data. That's something also to, uh, to, to keep in mind. When it comes to the whole issue of organizing qualitative data systematically, um, you know, when we look at issues such as storing data, uh, copying data, backing up, and retrieving data and handling and uh, analyzing data. I just want you to consider um, things like, you know, what formats are you are you organizing your data in? Um, how is your data to be uh, retrieved? And um, what issues could arise, for example, if there is uh, update with regard to um, software or what happens, for example, in a case, for example, of, of um, 
the emergency that we're living through at the moment of the pandemic or what happens to your data if you can't get access to that data at a time of crisis such as this. And also that issue which I raised earlier, which I think is a good one to reflect on about what happens at the end, if you like, at the end, you know, at the life cycle of your data. What happens to your data? Where is it stored? How long do you have to keep it for? And is there an obligation for you to uh, destroy your data or to, to, um, uh, uh, to confiscate effectively your data at the end of the project? So think about that also. And also issues of, well, who owns your data? Is it, is it your data to keep? Is it the universities? And uh, does it belong to um, a publication house where you have published your um, your data in a journal? So all these questions are ones to uh, reflect on and consider, and perhaps can give you a more rounded appreciation of of the of what you are actually doing um, when you are you know, organizing and uh, analyzing and engaged in, um, as I say, qualitative data analysis throughout your PhD. So also just think, just uh, again, this is something which came up uh, in the uh, webinar before on um, data management and how, you know, and just data management techniques throughout your PhD. Just think about, as I mentioned before, just keeping your materials in similar formats. That That's that's really important, I think, because it can be, become quite unwieldy, quite difficult to retrieve data if it's in, if it's in different formats. Um, also, this is good advice. I think this came from, um, this might have been from a session I, I did on, um, organizing and analyzing data in, I think this is in Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam University. There was a good tip there to collate raw data so that you have space to add comments. And I, I did this throughout my own PhD when I was tr transcribing interviews. I just made sure that there was enough there when, when I had written down um, everything, just to make sure, make sure that I had enough space to add comments uh, um, to, my, uh, to, my, to my transcripts. Um, it's important also to give each piece of raw data a code or a number um, or a, a, a reference marker for easy material, for, sorry, for easy retrieval of this material because um, we'll talk about coding and I'll just give you some examples of how coding is, is, is done or, or just, just to give you um, a, lit, a little introduction uh, to coding as we as we um, go on, and it's important also to keep a backup of everything and to source to store original materials safely um, and separate from backups. Obviously, so that's you know if you're dealing with primary data, you know it's so important that that is stored in a very very secure place. You know if you're dealing with archival research, for example, and I know someone who did a PhD and had a um, had a huge archive from a um, a, a particular family, a somewhat um, we might call them an, um, a merchant family, and the uh, data had to be stored very securely um, at the end of each, you know, at, at the end of each day, and it, and no one, nobody else could get access to that data or to that archive um, apart from this particular researcher. So there, there, there were whole issues with regard to how the how the data was preserved. So just think about, you know, if you are now for many of you, that won't be the case, but just think about, you know, if you are dealing with primary data, how do you store your um, originals safely and just to make sure to keep a backup of everything? Because as I say, it, you can be hit by a disaster like we had with the with the uh, pandemic where we have all to leave the university at very short notice. So it's very important to have backups and copies for easy retrieval. But I'm just going to talk about coding in a little while also. Just when it comes to qualitative data analysis, just um, this is a quote from Patton from 2002, that qualitative data um, analysis, that the goal or the objective of that is to uncover what might be called emerging themes or patterns, concepts, insights and understanding, which hopefully will reveal much more to us than the raw data in itself. I mean, raw data in itself doesn't necessarily reveal a great deal. It's how we interpret, analyze, evaluate and understand that data that really brings it to light. So qualitative data analysis, we can say that it can be it, it can be um, divided into five. Yeah, it's a five distinct categories. One is content analysis. So that's where you're categorizing, if you like, verbal or behavioral data 
and and in, in a way that allows you then to, to classify, perhaps to summarize and, and to tabulate that data in a format which is very understandable. So that's that's one. That's what so many of us do, content analysis. Um, perhaps I described it in a convoluted way there, but it's just about, you know, categorizing the data into an understandable format. Discourse analysis, and I know for many of you who are involved, for example, in applied linguistics, that you'll be very, very familiar with the whole area of discourse um, analysis. But for, for the rest of you, just to describe it in a very simplistic manner, in a very simplified manner, I should say, uh, discourse analysis, we could see perhaps as a method of analysis um, of, of what we might call of, of naturally occurring speech and, and talk that we and and dis, and uh, discourse that we all engage in. And um, it's it's an analysis of, of how we speak and how we communicate with each other and how that then is um, is is uh, uh, transmitted and how it's understood. I, I hope I've got that right. Uh, framework. So the next one that we have is something called framework analysis. And again, um, this is about, if you like, identifying within the data, within uh, within the data, if you like, a kind of a, a thematic framework. And this can involve, as I said, either things like charting, mapping, coding, and ultimately interpretation of the data itself. So this is this is just another form of analysis. I think it just might be useful for you just to have, you know, these uh, concepts because it can just help you to think, I suppose, more deeply about what it is that you're actually, you know, you're actually engaged in. Another, uh, and this causes a bit of, uh, this causes some confusion every now and again because we call it grounded theory. And in fact, many people say that grounded theory is not a theory at all, that's much more a method. And I suppose, yes, it is. It is actually a, a method. I would say rather than a theory, but ultimately grounded theory is um, contributing and indeed in some cases building a theory. So what is it? Well, it's it, grounded theory starts, we can say that it, it starts with the analysis of, of, um, of a single case in order to formulate or to build or to create um, a, a, a theory. And then what happens usually, if I understand, if I've understood it correctly, is that additional cases are built around that and they are then evaluated and examined to see if they can contribute to that particular theory. So it's it's a way of you like of constructing theory, but it's much more a method than an actual theory, and that leads to a bit of confusion. So you we could call this be like grounded analysis or a grounded method rather than uh, grounded theory, but of, officially it is called uh, grounded theory. And the last uh, type of, of uh, data analysis, excuse me, when it comes to qualitative data analysis that we have is something called narrative analysis. And again, in a, in a simple manner, this is, you know, um, uh, this is, if you like, taking into account, um, uh, if you like, the um, experience or the articulated or verbal experience, you know, experience of individuals as it's articulated and verbalized to us, as it's told to us. So it's effectively taking what people's insights and their stories, and it takes into the, the into account their different experiences and it it analyzes those in a manner you know which which is um uh, communicable and um and and understandable and i suppose what's what's important here is that narrative analysis it's a really good example of primary data because you're engaged in for example you know primary qualitative data because you're you're examining you know um the, the you're you're reformulating uh, people's stories. So that's what you're taking from respondents. You're taking their stories, but you're taking all into account also the context of, of each case and, and, and the context and different lived experience of each respondent. So that's what we might call narrative analysis as, as I understand them. Uh, and sorry, could I just ask everybody just to mute their microphones a moment? Just we have some uh, distraction there. OK, thank you. OK, so just look here and um, these again are just a couple of things. This is just to, if you like, distinguish a qual qualitative analysis from quantitative analysis. Um, 
normally when looking in in in, in, uh, in statistics or with quantitative analysis there's a focus on what's called the p value here it's replaced in qualitative analysis with something called you know pattern seeking and extracting meaning from rich and complex sources of linguistic or um or visual data um in qualitative analysis much effort is expended and directed uh, towards creating um, new categories. So we have like words and symbols and metaphors and, a, you know, we have all these linguistic tools and visual and visual um, uh, data and images which may be used instead of, if you like, the, you know, typical number crunching used in, in um, quantitative uh, data analysis. And we can say that it's less linear and it's less prescribed than statistical analysis used uh, analysis. So that's just a way of distinguishing both, if you like. Um, this is again from Souter from 2012, where Souter talks about, I just want you to reflect on this description of qualitative data analysis. So just think so, Think of the, the type. So this is what Souter said. Souter said, the types of thinking and skills needed for qualitative data analysis are different from those needed for quantitative data analysis. And I was somewhat surprised to read this because I thought the thinking and skills are different, you know, because everybody, you know, um, where people are engaged in research, I, I don't champion one above the other. I don't uh, see how, you know, quant I, I don't see why quantitative data analysis should be recognized as somewhat, um, that the thinking and skills required for that should be somewhat, um, should supersede those for quantitative data analysis. Quantitative data analysis, as I say, can really yield fantastic data, and uh, this, it, it needs a lot of uh, scientific rigor um, behind it also. So it's somewhat surprising that somebody would say that the types of thinking and skills needed for qualitative data analysis are different uh, to those needed for, for quantitative data analysis. Um, Souter makes the claim that creativity, divergent thinking, keen perception of patterns among ambiguity, which we can find quite uh, prevalent in qualitative data, and strong writing skills are helpful for qualitative data analysis. I, I think that these skills, to be honest, are as relevant for quantitative data analysis, but that's where I, I differ um, from, from Souter. So where Souter says where, st where statistical analysis often centers on the p-value, qualitative data analysis involves more time-consuming time even, time-consuming extraction of meaning from multiple sources of complex data. But that is not to say that quantitative data cannot be complex also, and we have infinite numbers of instances where quantitative data can also be very complex and can, can require incredible skills and deep intellectual thought to um, analyze and evaluate um, quantitative data. So I just wanted to put that out there about qualitative data, that there is a, a kind of sense that qualitative data requires a very, very different skill set from quantitative data. As I say, it's not something I necessarily agree with, because I, I don't like the idea of one type of 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 of, um, of one uh, method or methodology being championed uh, above the other, um, when both types of um, when qu qualitative data and quantitative data analysis can yield you know such such fantastic data. I think there are advantages, obviously, and disadvantages to both, and very much depend on a particular situation what it is that we're that we're striving to find okay um just with regard to uh, an inductive approach and i suppose if we talk about inductive research and i guess for so many of you what you're what you're engaging in is inductive research where you're you're observing a phenomena you're observing if you like specific phenomena and making observations about specific phenomena and then drawing generalizations or if you like creating theory from from that would effectively becomes uh, the, the 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 creation of theory or making up making your making um findings or conclusions based on the observation of specific phenomena so qualitative is i suppose it's important to remember the qualitative data analysis generally often follows i'd say often rather than generally follows a um an inductive approach 
uh, in the sense that explicit theories are not imposed on the data um, beforehand. So the data, if you like, are allowed to speak for themselves, you know, by the emergence of conceptual categories and descriptive themes, as Souter says. So just to, to distinguish it, if you like, um, what, what, what this means effectively is that, you know, qualitative data a lot of the time doesn't begin, doesn't, doesn't always begin with a general theory that is imposed on the data. It's that the data will yield um, the theory. And this is very much the case with regard to, for example, to grounded theory, which I mentioned earlier. So that's just one approach to qualitative data analysis, if you like, that that is somewhat perceived that, that you have an inductive as opposed to a deductive approach to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the data analysis. I just want to dwell for a moment here on something called research design versus research methods. And just forgive me if I'm going back and forth and um, between concepts and ideas, but re research design and research methods, it just might be useful for you to know exactly, you know, what's the difference between them? Because sometimes there's confusion about um, um research methods sometimes it's sometimes um a, a, a method is is ascribed to a design so just to let you know that both of these ideas both of these concepts are are closely related but i would say that research design is a plan to answer your research question so how are you going to go about answering your research question and for some of you this may well be a question which appears in your um, that your examiners will posit to you in your viva voce. You know how tell us about your research design rather than necessarily about your research question, but or for example, or your research method. So how did you you know devise? How did you create this plan to answer your research question? So that comes a bit before the method itself, and the method is the strategy. We can say the strategy that you use to implement that plan. And again. You know, we've talked a lot and I hope it doesn't confuse you when I raise issues, for example, with regard to distinguishing research method from uh, research uh, methodology. But I would say we have something else thrown in here, OK, called research design. Just that's your plan, you know, for how you're going to answer your research question. I'll just give you some examples of research design and, and obviously research method is, you know, how you go about um, answering um, that question, what what tools or instruments you use to answer the research question. So these, if you like, are, are types of qualitative um, research design. And one of those, for example, would be grounded theory, our friend grounded theory, which we saw as a form of, you know, a form of analysis, but it's also a type of research design. And obviously grounded theory sets out, as I said, to construct or to discover theory from data. That's usually what it, you know, it's, it's, it's a grounded theory is, you know, where you're looking at analysis perhaps of a, of a single case um, and um, with the intention, for example, of formulating a theory and then you examine additional cases to see if they contribute to the theory. So you could be dealing with a very, very small sample, um, very small sample size in which to construct or discover um, to just construct a new theory or, or to discover um, a, a theory from, from the data. So, the, you know, um, that in itself can have its limitations because you are ascribing or, or, or you are generating theory from a, a very small um, group of participants. Um, another type of research design could be ethnographic studies. That's where the researcher or the researchers absolve, sorry, where they observe or they interact with participants in the real life environment. So that's another way, if you like, of looking at, you know, um, um, of, 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 if you like, of engaging in research design. And again, th sometimes there can be a lot of confusion, very, very understandable confusion um, between research design and, uh, and 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 research methods. So just think of, you know, research design is your plan to answer your research question and your method is your strategy for how to implement that plan. OK, so phenomenology is another type of qualitative research design. That's where you focus on a participant's lived experience in relation to what's been studied. So you could be studying, for example, you know, the effects 
of um, uh, the effects of, for example, um, we'll say it could be something such as um, something traumatic, such as, for example, how people uh, cope in a particular situation or how, what effect does, for example, contracting a, a very, you know, cardiovascular disease have on a participant's um, engagement with, um, for example, with um, exercise, for example. So, so phenomenology looks at the lived experience you know, uh, of 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 participants. So it's it's basically looking on um, uh, how uh, part. It's it's a study of um, participants' experience of a particular phenomenon. And case studies, which I think will be familiar to so many of you, which describe, compare, and evaluate different aspects of a research problem. So all of these we can see as forms of um, of of research design. Now, when it comes to method, so there's a little bit of difference, as I say, between research design and 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 research method. So think about, you know, what what method that you're going to be using for your your PhD. Now, it's it can be argued, of course, that a, an observation or an interview method um, can help you to obtain more uh, in-depth information with regard to your PhD. I would always say that, you know, it's very important that you consider this with with your um, supervisory team in advance and think about you know the methods that you're going to use and think about what methods you're not going to use because it's always a good idea to be able to you know be prepared for your viva voce to say well I use this this particular method or methods and I didn't use these others and you if it's a really strong um it shows, uh, if you like, that you have really thought about the whole concept of re of of research and undertaking research, and reflecting on the kinds of methods used. If you're able to say, I didn't use these particular methods because I felt that, you know, for whatever reason, it may be that you felt that they weren't going to yield the data that was required, or that you felt that they were not sufficient to answer the research question. So just think about, you know, what's going to yield, you know, what method is going to yield the richest information. But I would also say, I would also say, and again, so important that you discuss this with your supervisor, that you really have to consider, you know, what what time or what, um, how much can you allocate uh, to um, data collection? Uh, so just think about that um, before, uh, before you decide on a, on a particular method. And obviously, as I mentioned, if you can assess, you know, the strengths and weaknesses associated with a particular method, with the method that you use, but also with the methods that you didn't use, that's a really strong point when it comes to, you know, um, not only your PhD, but also to the Viva Voce examination afterwards. These are common, if you like, qualitative research methods. One would be action research. And that's effectively, if you like, um, engaged in the participant, you know, close observation of, of participants. That is effectively um, uh, engaging in a form of research in which you are uh, near, you are effectively a, 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 a participant. Archival study, obviously, you'll be well aware, particularly with regard to history. Focus groups and interviews, very, very common as a form of uh, research methods. Obviously, observation or participant uh, observation. Um, secondary data analysis, um, which is used in so many disciplines, English literature, for example, being, being one of those. Um, surveys and uh, questionnaires, all of these are very, very, can be very, very effective um, research methods or research methods tools. When it comes to analysis itself, just when we reflect on what analysis is, um, because it, you know, data in itself, um, as I said, um, it's it's how we interpret and evaluate it and, and uh, draw uh, conclusions from uh, from the data. I suppose that give it, you know, that that really give it its richness. But when we talk about analysis or analysis and and, and qualitative data analysis. Um, Watling said back in 2002 that analysis is the researcher's equivalent of alchemy. It's the elusive process by which you can turn your raw data into nuggets of pure gold. 
such magic calls for science and art in equal measure. And I would certainly agree with that, that, that you know, transforming your data it does call for art and creativity and ingenuity, but also science, but also a great, a great deal of, you know, intellectual rigor and discipline behind that as well. So a, a reliable method is needed for when it comes to organizing um, and analyzing your data, a, a, a robust and reliable system is required for identifying, for collecting, for storing, for analyzing, for retrieving and for reporting on the data that is um, relevant and appropriate to your project. And I would say also to reflect on the sequence in which your data are to be collected um, and think, first of all, you know, do you do a survey? Do you do an interview? Do you do a focus group? How do you go about, you know, in which sequence is your data to be collected? And another question would be, you know, do you begin analysis of the data while you're still collecting? And I, I would be strong on, on an answer. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But I think that's just another and something that is worth reflecting on. You know, are you going to collect all the data first? Are you going to um, involve yourself in a very um, heavy duty collection and field work, which will yield um, all, all of this data, which you will then analyze and transform into um, what Watling called, you know, these nuggets of pure gold and into this um, really, really vital information uh, that is necessary uh, to uh, the undertaking of your PhD. So just reflect on that also, you know, what sequence is your data to be collected? And it's always good to know and to think about and to justify how you have ordered and used your data. So think about, you know, did you um, do the analysis, did you, after doing the, the or as you began data collection, did you begin to do the analysis straight away or how did you go about um, collecting your data? So just think about those also and think about, you know, what sequence and order did these things happen? And always what's good for that is something which um, I reflected on and talked about in the um, project managing your thesis webinar before. Just using something like a milestone chart or a Gantt chart can really help you in that regard. OK, so just with regard to, you know, analysis, I would say that analysis is an ongoing process at all stages of, of the project. So even as you begin your data collection, it's always good to be analyzing uh, the data that's coming in, even in the very early stages of the of, of the data collection process. It's also really important to recognize and to manage something called researcher bias or subjectivity. And I'll talk for a moment about researcher bias and the kinds of bias that we can find. And again, I'm, I'm determined not to go um, beyond the hour mark with our webinar today. And we can talk about this in more detail afterwards. But um, it's just really, really important that you manage and you recognize researcher bias and respondent bias also. Um, because there are certain forms of researcher bias, but also forms of respondent bias, and I'll come to those in a couple of moments. And obviously coding, the coding of qualitative data enables patterns or themes to be identified. And just when it comes to um, uh, the data analysis and the various project stages that we can say that there are, we can say that first of all, you know, what you're doing is you're defining and that you're identifying data. Um, that 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 your you, that um, your um, collection is yielding this data. You're you're defining the data to be collected. You're identifying it, and then you're you're going out and and you're engaging in it. You're first of all, if you like, you're engaged in sampling. So it could be pur purpose of sampling or snowball sampling. You must decide on your sample size. Very important that you engage with your supervisor on deciding. How big is your sample size going to be? And just to make sure that your sample size is not too unwieldy, because particularly when you're dealing with qualitative research, a lot of us try to be ambitious and to have large sample sizes. But sometimes that can that can mean that the the data itself is not as rich as it should be. So that's something that which is uh, it, that that is a, a, that is a um, a byproduct, if you like, or of of each. Um, PhD project. So that's something that you have to um, reflect on before you go and begin your data collection. Obviously, then you have to think about categorizing 
and uh, you know and and manipulating data and that doesn't mean that you you go and you you manipulate you manipulate the data what i mean that doesn't go in a, in a in a in a in a bad sense what i mean here is that you're categorizing uh the data and you're um uh you're you're putting it into into various as uh, you're segmenting the data segmenting might be a better word to use than manipulating there so you're categorizing the data in in in, in into various formats and also you could be engaged in particularly when it comes to uh grounded theory if if you know if you're using um grounded theory as your form of qualitative qualitative data analysis that you're engaged in theory building and testing and you're also then engaged in reporting and writing up the research at the um uh, and writing up your findings um as a result of your data collection and data analysis process just with regard to coding i mentioned coding there just how important coding is for, for, you know when we're engaged in um particularly when you're engaged in in identifying if you like or formulating if you like a thematic uh framework or just trying to identify patterns in your research or themes in your research um throughout the, the the PhD. So coding would allow you to um, segment uh, and to categorize themes and patterns in in your research. And there's a lot of different types of software which can be used for this. In vivo would be perhaps the most famous of those. There are others like um, uh, Deduce and RQDA, etc. So these can all be used uh, with regard to coding. I just want to show you an example of coding and how it might look um, or what types of um, categories can emerge from uh, from various questions that are posed. This is from um, um, Dudov Dudovsky, which is from 2018. And this is a table. This is just research titles um, and elements which are to be coded and just how to identify um, relevant code. So if you look there on the left, you see there it says research title, born or bred, revising the great man theory of leadership in the 21st century. That was the notion that, you know, that leadership required um, a great man or somebody imbued with a cult of personality or a very, very strong um, leader that, uh, or, or for example, a um, uh, a leader that would be universally respected within a territory or country or a leader that uh, was charismatic and had um, incredible qualities of ambition and innovation and drive. Uh, so this was a notion that, you know, that that leadership, um, that that leaders were um, were effectively, you know, that they were born, that they that they were um, that that uh, the great man theory meant that you know that a leader was someone who would um, uh, uh, attract universal respect. So this is a, a project. So it says born or bred, uh, revising the great man theory of leadership in the 21st century. Think, look there at the elements of that to be coded. It says leadership practice. So these, those are the elements that one is looking to code and using the following codes: born leaders made leaders and leadership effectiveness. So there are codes which are used to categorize or to create themes within the research. Really useful as a way of segmenting and making the research more manageable. Um, if you look here, if you look at the um, the last one here on the left hand side where it says an investigation into the ways of customer relationship management in mobile marketing environments. So look there at elements to be coded. It says tactics and look then at um, what, uh, what, what codes are to be used. There's viral messages, customer retention and popularity of social networking. I'm just giving you this as an example of of um, how people can go about, you know, using codes uh, um, and how it can really help to categorize and segment and make the research more understandable. And again, my colleague Anna Dwyer has arranged for a great number of sessions on uh, coding and on um, qualitative data analysis software uh, for um, workshops for you. Um, she's set, set up a number, a number of in vivo workshops uh, for, um, for for PhD researchers 
at the university and these are really really worth attending so just uh, i'm just going to mention go just going to go quickly through the rest of this presentation just to talk about researcher bias now researcher bias whether we know it or not we all have our own preconceived ideas um or um uh, you know preconceptions uh, about various things Panucci and Wilkins said back in 2010, they said bias can occur in the planning, data collection, analysis and publication phases of research. Understanding research bias allows readers to critically and independently review the scientific literature and avoid treatments which are suboptim suboptimal or potentially harmful. So there can be a case of researcher bias and respondent bias, I would say also, in in research which is something which you have to be careful about and think about and reflect on before you begin the the, the process of undertaking you know uh of, of of undertaking evaluation and assessment of your um of of your uh, data collection and your research findings so as a as a researcher you you may not be able to identify your own if you like your own preconceived ideas um, it can be difficult for us to identify our own biases and to be to be objective about our own biases or to or to be if you like to be um, aware of them um, because we sometimes don't like to think that we are imbued with certain uh, preconceived ideas um, about various things in life. So it's important to identify, I would say, sources of bias and apply techniques to reduce them. Now, Sarniak back in 2015. Oh drew up a list of um, of biases, nine different types of biases. I'm just going to list them here because we won't have time to go through them in any depth, but we can talk about them afterwards. First of all, we have something called acquiescence bias. This is among respondents. Habituation bias. Uh, socially desirable, social desirability bias. Sponsor bias, where someone can engage in what we might call captive research. And just in terms of the researcher um, of, of you, these are the kind of biases which sometimes can appear among researchers. Confirmation bias, which I think is well known, is, is, is perhaps the best known form of bias. Cultural bias, the halo effect, uh, leading questions and wording bias. And again, that's something which is important to avoid or try to avoid undertaking uh, research. And the question order bias, how you actually frame the questions, or for example, in a survey, the order in which you put the questions can have a great impact into, into how the questions are actually answered. So by the respondents, and that can lead to a distortion of the data or could yield a different result to what you would get with a different um, order or sequence of your questions. OK, so as I say, I'll just leave those there for now and we'll we may come back to those in our discussion at the end so i would say just in terms of managing researcher bias what do you do it's important i think to acknowledge your own preconceptions and one could even say prejudices um i don't uh, uh, your 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 formulated ideas um your pre um if you like or or your the ideas that have been formulated from your own lived experience uh, and acknowledge those and what influence that is going to have in your research. Now, it may have none, but the important thing is to try to avoid any kind of bias in, in while you're undertaking your research because it can lead to a distortion of data and it can lead to um, yielding data which is not as rich or doesn't tell us as much as you know, if you are to be a more objective, if you were a more objective researcher. So a good way of of um, preventing, if you like, researcher bias is to check for alternative explanations of, of what you have done. And um, that's always a good way of of seeking to manage researcher bias. Have an, another way you could do this. And again, this isn't always possible, but have the participants review re your results now. It could be the case that participants don't like what you reveal in your results, but just um, it. But also, it can be beneficial for to give your participants insight into what um, uh, what 
conclusions or what results you have come to as a result of of the data before you b before you publish it again um this isn't a necessary precondition of doing a phd but it can be it can be a good way of eliminating um your own bias uh, from the uh, fr uh, from the research it's always good also to review, and again, this isn't always possible, but to review your findings with your colleagues and with your peers. This is always a good way just of, um, of being more objective uh, about the data and more objective about the forms of analysis that you undertake. Um, also, uh, and again, for so many of you, this isn't possible, um, you know, due to resources and other issues, but it's it's a really good way to prevent researcher biases to have um different people code your data again that's not always possible and sometimes not even desirable um with regard to a a, a phd but it's a, but it's a way if you like it's a technique for avoiding or for attenuating or for uh, diminishing researcher bias and I would say also that this help, that you can verify with more sources of data or something called triangulation, which I'm just going to explain now. So triangulation is a method, if you like, that involves cross checking multiple data sources and collection procedures to evaluate the extent to which all the evidence, if you like, uh, all the evidence adds up or that all the evidence makes sense. So it's a good way. It involves cross checking and corroborating across uh, data sources and that's a really good way of if you like of preventing uh, any kind of bias uh, or any kind of distortion appearing in the data um, triangulation it will increase trust in the validity of your uh, of, of your study and that is really really important something else which i'm just going to dwell upon for a moment and again this is a really really hard thing for so many people to realize when they're engaging in engaged in data collection and data analysis is that particularly with data analysis is something called saturation and that I'll just ask you just to turn off your microphones a moment if you wouldn't mind please thank you just saturation is is a certain point that's reached in a data analysis which which effectively means that the study is is complete and it's what we can, can call a point of diminishing returns now if any of you've done economics you'll know about diminishing marginal utility or diminishing marginal returns so diminishing returns is when uh, what you're getting back or what's been yielded has really got to the point where it's 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 almost uh, at zero or it's negligible and that means that there's little more need for there's little or no more need for analysis or for sampling or for uh, data co collection and certainly not for any more uh, data analysis that the study effectively you know is 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 as good as complete so that's if you like saturation point uh and that's where you know new data all it's doing is confirming what what you have at uh, the conclusions that you have already reached um i would ask you just just as we finish uh, and again we can talk about this perhaps afterwards just reflect on the following points i would say reflect um on the main focus of your thesis you know what is your thesis actually about think about the research design and the methods that you're using um again this is something which you can do in your own time reflect upon this and see if you know if they are the ones that are appropriate or they are the ones that yield the best the best type of data think about the type of data that you're gathering you know and how you're going to evaluate and to analyze that data think also about the order in which you are collecting and in which you're analyzing the data again and, and try to justify you know the order and the sequence in which you're doing that um and and think about you know how you're how you're organizing your data uh for analysis and think also about potential for bias by you and the participants you know or are the participants are they merely um are they engaging in acquiescence bias where they are merely if you like confirming they want to be seen to confirm um uh, or, or they want to give you the answers that you think that they think you want to hear. So that's uh, very different from getting 
really strong, uh, rich and, uh, and, and objective data. So yes, so for now, that's the presentation finished. So I want to thank you all for your time and, and for your patience. And I realize it's, it's a long, it's a long time to be listening to, to, to one person uh, pontificating about a particular subject. So thank you very much for your uh, participation and say in your time. I'm just going to stop the recording now and then we can engage in a discussion if you'd like to add any comments or to uh, provide any insight from your own research that you think might be useful. Um, Good afternoon, Chair. How are you? Thank Hello. you for that wonderful Hello. delivery. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Quick question, the last slide. Um, I've come across this a few times, uh, the reflection where